If you're unaware, T-Mobile calls themselves the uncarrier, which is fitting, considering they've just unraveled their price lock guarantee for new customers. If you ask me, that's pretty uncool. If you're uncomfortable with a company that says one thing but does another, then stick with Xfinity, whose whole home Wi-Fi, wired internet, service, speed, and reliability are unparalleled. Avoid the uncarrier. Stick with Xfinity. Effective for new customers after 117.24, T-Mobile's price lock will only reimburse your last bill if you terminate service due to a price increase. Look, Bumble knows you're exhausted by dating. All the, must not take yourself too seriously, and 6-1 since that matters, and what do I even say other than, hey? <sighs> well, that's why they're introducing an all-new Bumble. With exciting features to make compatibility easier, starting the chat better, and dating safer. They've changed, so you don't have to. Download the new Bumble now. Hey, Famous and Gravy listeners, Michael Osborne here. If you've been following our show, you know that lately we have been doing a number of re-releases. That's because we're working on the show behind the scenes, and new episodes are going to be coming out very soon. There's a lot of excitement in store. In the meantime, we have been looking in our back catalog and thinking about some of the hidden gems. Today's episode is very much that. One of the things we do on the show is try and take the biographical information that really is available to everybody, but look at it from a different point of view, from a different angle. And sometimes when you look at it from a different angle, you kind of come to a different conclusion about what this life was really all about. The other thing is that we've always been interested in celebrity and fame itself. And there's probably no episode in our back catalog that more speaks to that question. So I'm very excited to bring this to you today. Stay tuned for new episodes in the coming weeks. In the meantime, enjoy. Now for the opening quiz to reveal today's dead celebrity. This person died in 2016, age 99. She operated a mail order cosmetics company. She once offered $1 million to anyone who could prove she had had a facelift. <laughs> Who would be makeup y? <laughs> makeup I like that word. Going to like an Avon lady. I don't know who. <gasps> Mary Kay! Not Mary Kay, but good guess. From the 1950s into the 1990s, she was on scores of television programs talk shows, game shows, comedy specials, westerns, and episodic dramas. Joan Rivers? It's not Joan Rivers, right? It's not Joan Rivers. We've already done Joan Rivers. But <laughs> she appeared as a nightclub manager in Orson Welles' 1958 classic, Touch of Evil, and the same year as a sexy alien in Queen of Outer Space. I don't know those movies, but now I want—I really want to watch this sexy space alien movie. <laughs> in 1989, she was arrested for slapping a police officer. Ah. Uh. Elizabeth Taylor? Oh, so close. She was married at least eight times and called everyone darling. Oh, Zaza Gabor. Zaza Gabor? <laughs> Today's dead celebrity is Zaza Gabor. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! That's so exciting. <laughs> Gee, well, where does the money come from? Honey, I work every day of my life. Mm -hmm. And most of these things I bought, not all, but most of them. And I made, I never stopped since working. And I really wanted to be a veterinary. Yeah, veterinary. That's, yeah if you hadn't gone into acting, is there a chance that you would have, would have done that? I all my life, I still am. I have five dogs at home and two horses. I would love to do that, but I have no time because I have to support all the animals. And so that costs lots of money. So I work as an actress. What can you do? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Welcome to Famous and Gravy. I'm Michael Osborne. My name is Amit Kapoor. And on this show, we go through a series of categories about multiple aspects of a famous person's life. We want to figure out the things in life that we would actually desire. And ultimately answer a big question, would I want that life? Today, Zsa Zsa Gabor died at 2016, age 99. First line of the obituary, Zsa Zsa Gabor. The Hungarian actress whose self-parodying glamour and revolving door marriages to millionaires put a luster of American celebrity on a long but only modestly successful career in movies and television died on Sunday in Los Angeles. She was 99. Wow, just 
kick a woman while she's dead. <laughs> so you found it insulting. Yeah, absolutely. Where did the offense begin? Self-parroting the luster, only moderate success. I think all these things are true, though. Maybe it was the way you read it. I don't know. I actually think that this is a very nuanced and very accurate capturing of who this person was. I think there is absolutely a parody of oneself aspect to who she becomes later in life. The revolving door marriages, I mean, that was a joke that she was in on and everybody was making basically from the mid-60s onward. And her career really was only modestly successful. Like, she wasn't that big of a star. I agree. So, did they say anything positive? I took away everything having a negative slant. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, put a luster of American celebrity. What does that mean? Like a, a gloss? Make it look shiny. Make fame look like a shiny, lustery object. Yes. She did that. It is attributing an accomplishment as well. Yes, that's my point. I think that if there's anything in here that looks like praise, that's it. Okay, I'm with you on that. I'm with you. I'm also with you in that it's mostly an insulting first line of an obituary. Yeah, which I don't think is completely appropriate because not everyone hated her, and I think very few people hated her. You can look back now, and she wouldn't be relevant at all now. But I think people loved her. There is a presumption in the first line of this obituary that American celebrity and Hollywood fame is a problem. To be famous is a bad thing. Exactly. And to play up your fame is a bad thing. Yeah, it totally has a ding-dong, the witch is dead right. feel to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a good way of putting it. Where did it end again? What was the last, like, phrase? Long, but only modestly successful career in movies and television. She was very successful at playing herself and getting that self-airtime. She was, in, in some ways, a great TV interviewee. I mean, I think that's a hard thing to kind of cram in here. That, that language is missing here. She was fun and good on playing herself on a talk show or on a game show. Our first guest tonight is uh, one of the all-time great talk show guests. She is also a princess and the only woman I know named Zsa, Zsa. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Zsa, Zsa Gabor. Okay, I was starting off at a fairly high score. You've kind of talked me back a little bit. What are you giving this? I just find it too opinionated, which I don't like in the obituary. So I'm going four. Wow. That's not Somebody is here to level. defend Zsa, Zsa. Goddamn. Wait a sec. I'm, All right, I'm to defend a fair trial. You know, here's something I've been thinking about with this category. How much we're factoring in the challenge, like how difficult it is to capture somebody's you know, it, life in the lead of the obituary, in the first line. Some people, I think it kind of writes themselves. I remember giving a high score for Nelson Mandela. I remember giving a high score for Neil Armstrong. Their accomplishments and why we know their names are kind of easy to describe in a sentence. Why we know who Zsa, Zsa Gabor is and what she's famous for is not easy to capture in one sentence. But they didn't rise to the challenge. See, I disagree. I think they did. I'll settle on eight. I think that this is actually very accurate, and they did a pretty good job of getting it. By the way, is that the biggest gap you and I have had between a, a four-point spread? Yeah. I think so. Should we talk about why we're doing this episode? Yeah. I kind of think this was your idea. It was my suggestion for a couple of reasons. She was very much a part of our childhoods, you know, after-school TBS type of celebrity. Most importantly is we talk about mixing categories of celebrity. Yeah. Right. We do athletes, musicians, movie stars, politicians. Astronauts. <laughs> yes. Astronauts. So this is a category of celebrity that's untouched yet for us is the meta celebrity, famous for being famous. So I read a book about the Gabors, and I've read a couple in preparing, because one thing about Zsa, Zsa Gabor, there is no shortage of possible material. She's not the least bit Gaboring. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this will be boring. I did not know how many comparisons there were with the Kardashians. So I read this book called Finding Zsa Zsa by this guy named Sam Staggs, who lives in Dallas, by the way. He didn't like this idea of they're famous for being famous. He says, on the contrary, they were famous because they worked at their careers every hour, every day for close to a century, which I think is to your point about the obituary. There's not credit for, you know, the actual accomplishment of just being relevant and famous 
But here's the other line that I, I really wanted to bring. In terms of the comparison with the Kardashians, he's like sort of bashing them. And he says, perhaps the Kardashians and other vapid celebrities aspire to Gabor, Caliber, and Finesse. All of these no doubt enrolled in Gaborology 101, but they flunked the course. Yeah, I kind of agree with this comparison a little bit in that she was a personality, meaning that she was the combination of the looks, the story, and how she spoke about it. I think it's really true. Like they were, every every sort of account I read was they kind of appeared on the social pages and were there forevermore. All of this is said in a New York Times obit way of a negative slant that when we talk about fame on this show, pretty much everyone up to this point has brought a unique skill or accomplishment that was what presented them into the spotlight and they took it further for additional reasons or additional ways that they carried themselves. But famous for being famous, what you're arguing is that there's no skill that actually elevates you to the level of fame. It's it's sort of easy to play armchair psychology and say that there's something, I don't know, pathetic about that impulse to want to have attention and keep attention on you. I would not call it pathetic, but I do think that that's like the presumption of it, that there's something shallow about seeking and maintaining fame. I agree. I think that's kind of a bullshit explanation because I think it could be a pathway to your own inside self is getting external validation where you feel comfortable enough to actually start doing the inner work. Yes. Nobody Although I'm is, not sure that happened here. Yeah, but nobody is born enlightened. Maybe that's some of why we're having this conversation. Uh, shall we get to the categories? Yes, please. All right. Category two, five things I love about you. Here, Amit and I work together to get at five reasons why we're talking about this person. I would like you to start, please. Gladly. I found her very complimentary and charming on all of these talk show appearances that she did. Her catch word was darling, darling. She used words like adore and love, and she really like put a lot of air into those words, but a warm, like hugging air. I think she's just one of those people that uh, if she's around somebody that she likes or respects or is at least neutral towards, she lifts them up. Yeah, I agree with that. You know where I actually saw that, of all places, was a Howard Stern interview. Look at me with a princess. Princess Zaja Gabor. And Zsa you- I'm ready for the fight with you. I love you. You are not going to fight with me tonight. We are going to be lovers tonight. You, uh, yes, you, I'm going to say something. I hear the best things about you. You do. She was very, like, putting them at ease and having fun. But, like, she plays tennis. You know, she matches you where you're at. And I think complimentary is a good way of putting it. That's a great number one, Amit. Thank you, dear Michael. (laughs) Uh, We'll call this number two. She threw a great party. She did. She was legendary for her parties. Often showed up in Life magazine. I mean, people were like, oh, Zsa's having a party? Fuck yeah. There's a few that came up in this book I read. But this came up in the Diego Maradona episode where he, you know, paid for everybody to show up at his wedding. Yes. I think it's a great thing to throw a great party. I think it, you know you have to be thoughtful. I think she was. I think you have to do exactly as you said, like make everybody feel like they belong and that they're comfortable and that, you know, lifting everybody up. I like it. I'm going to say the other thing I think that is important about being somebody who does create parties and hosts great parties, events are signposts of life. You know, it's where a lot of pictures are generated. It's where you answer the question, what do you do? Last month, what are you doing in the next six months? If you have an event or a party to go to, that's the signpost that you use. And somebody has to play that role of throwing really good parties. And I think it's an admirable thing to play that role. That's really good. That's a really good way of thinking about it. All right, what do you got next? So mine, which will be our collective number three, anti-ageist. Oh, wow. There's a couple of ways to think about it. The downside view would be, you know, she had this thing about never revealing her age, Mm -hmm. even when she was in like her 60s, 70s, when she was really doing this major talk show circuit in Hollywood Squares and all of that. So there was a little bit of like, she's concealing her age. She's always being youthful. But I think the positive side of that is she basically made old look fun. I think that was really lacking in the culture back then. It's still lacking a lot in the culture now. Really up until things started to go south for her in the 2000s, it was always like, I'm having the time of my life. 
And I think that was a great thing. And I, I'll compare that to something I saw on Twitter. It was about, you wonder why our generation is so messed up around age. And it went through all these like 80s and 90s sitcoms and showed the real ages of the actors that are playing them. You would have a 45-year-old playing like a grandpa in overalls who just right. like complains all the time and smokes a pipe and plays golf. Like we had yeah, the very- 90210 cast was like famously in their 20s and 30s. Yes. Like Luke Perry was in, I think, his 30s when playing a high schooler. Exactly. So you had that, right? You had that this, like, um, that you always have to play younger and younger in order to look fun. Uh, And then you also had that the party ends, you know, after a certain age and that you're in the rocking chair. And that was very much the TV culture at the time. And Zsa Zsa was the opposite of that. But isn't the retort to that that it's delusional? There's a whole lot about what she says that is not necessarily a reliable narrator. And, and that's like, I don't want to call it lie number one, but certainly like, I don't know, non-truth number one. <laughs> the story that I'm telling myself is that she knew exactly what age she was and she was just playing around in this flirty game, but she was still giving this message of I'm having the time of my life and that time is right now. At the time that she's on Letterman and Larry King and making all these flirty jokes and yeah. and drawing all this attention to her, she's probably older than the entire cast of the Golden Girls. Yeah. But look at the difference on how they kind of presented the joy of life at a senior age. Could we say young at heart? Or is no, because I think it's specifically not doing what you're supposed to be doing as an 80-year-old woman. That I love. That is outstanding and true to her. Okay. So I think we're great. I think we can shake hands on number three. I think so, too. All right. Number four? Yes. All right. Preparing for this episode really got me thinking about the very first Famous and Gravy episode with Robin Leach. And when we got to the Vanderbeek, I said yes, because what if it's all just a big fucking joke? There is a little bit of it's a big fucking joke attitude with Zsa Zsa Gabor. Mm -hmm. As you and I keep working on this show, I need to be able to revisit that idea that (laughs) life is a big fucking joke. Why am I taking it so seriously? Yes, I want agency. Yes, there are things I want to accomplish. Yes, I have desires and I have goals. And (sighs) part of me sometimes still feels like it's all just a big fucking joke. And I think she really embodies that. Uh, I'm with you on that. And I, I think that's, there's a lot of Robin Leach on that. Like she would be exactly the one that Robin Leach would profile. There is a certain desirability in those types of people that are just kind of fuck it all, but within boundaries, right? You still maintain your ideal self. You're not hurting anyone. You're just kind of making a joke of the whole big thing. And I think it is something kind of to love about somebody I'll tell you where I struggle with it, though. It seems that there's too much defiance of meaning in the giant circus. Maybe that's okay. Maybe it is a construct. Not even real. Yeah, meaning could just be a door that you accidentally opened or were shoved through. And if you never have to get anywhere near that door, I think that's kind of okay. Yeah. Well, that's my number four. I do have uh, a number five, but perhaps you'd like to propose a number five? My number five was confidence. Mm. And this is going to be very specifically in speaking and just how quickly she could respond to any question lobbied at her. I mean, she was basically a stand-up comic facing a heckler all the time. And (laughs) every single ball thrown at her, she swung and hit a line drive. And for, you know, a woman of her era, that's damn impressive. There is a difference between confidence and arrogance, and I didn't see hers as arrogance. I would actually sign off on that number five and just add a little asterisk to it and say confident and funny. She's actually really fucking funny. Yeah. There's some great zippy one-liners and it's quick. And so George went to London to play one of his King Arthur's. So Tam said, Josh, how would you like to come on a show called Bachelor's Haven? I said, I loved it. Bachelor's Haven. Bachelor's Haven. Next day, I got life cover, look cover. I got MGM studio contract for... Long term. Just for being on this one show? Yeah, but I said such outrageous things. Somebody said, for example, what do you do if you break up the engagement? You have to give back the ring. I said, you must give back the ring, but keep the stone. Things like that. (laughs) (laughs) 
Category three, Malkovich Malkovich. This category is named after the movie Being John Malkovich, in which people take a portal into John Malkovich's head where they can have a front row seat right behind his eyes and know what it's like to have his experiences. What do you got? I got one, but I want you to go. All right. Her career in the 50s is actually sort of respectable. She does this movie Moulin Rouge, the original Moulin Rouge with John Huston, who's this famous director, and gets really positive reviews. Then Orson Welles asked her to have a small role in that movie Touch of Evil, which is also kind of like, you know, artistic. That same year, she does Queen of Outer Space. And I don't know if you've watched the trailer. This movie is fucking ridiculous. It almost looks like softcore porn for the 1950s. It's like those Austin Powers. The Fembots, aren't they called? Like the Austin Powers montages of the Fembots. Yeah, 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 yeah. My Malkovich moment is when she was presented with that script and she said, yes, I'll take on that role. Landing on an unknown planet... They are captured by long-limbed beauties. And the queen of outer space is Jaja Gabor. There's a lot going on in her life around this time. One of her marriages is falling apart. There's a very scandalous figure she gets involved with in the late 50s. Something about saying yes to this movie and her career does this hard right turn that never really comes back from. What the fuck was going through her head when she said, yeah, I'd like to be the star of Queen of Outer Space. What other careers are comparable? To the extent that there's Kardashian comparisons with the Gabors, I was like, whose acting career was on this upward trajectory of, boy, they're knocking it out of the park, and then just like, totally went sideways. The best I came up with was Nicolas Cage. And the upward trajectory of Nicolas Cage was leaving Las Vegas. I mean, he won an Oscar. Yeah. In like 2004 or something. And then like started doing all these fucking terrible movies and has been, I mean, almost a parody of himself. So what makes this a Malkovich moment is you want to see the calculation that she's making in saying yes. Yeah. It's an interesting narrative when you pose that question because it's very easy to see how 40 years later you end up as a regular on Hollywood Squares. Like if it were a Jeopardy question, about like, this is how you end up as a regular on Hollywood Squares. And the correct answer is, what is except the lead role in Queen from Outer Space? (laughs) It's a lot of game shows going into that little thought experiment. I think in game shows. What do you got for Malkovich? So I think I need to clarify that Malkoviches aren't always good. It is what is often the most unique experience that they may have had in their life or something that is such an odd combination of sensation or decision-making that you kind of want to see how it's done. So I made that precursor because this is not a happy one. The next category is love and marriage, and so we will get into that long-storied past of hers, but two of her husbands, George Sanders, and the other one, I believe, his name was Jack Ryan. Correct, so the inventor of the Barbie doll. He was a VP for Mattel. Yeah, So they both killed themselves. Sanders in 72 and Ryan in 91, both after she had been married to them. And and by no means am I implying that she had any role to do in it, but this is somebody that she was close to and loved. Sanders she describes as the love of her life, yeah. What I think is really unique and very interesting, and I think probably valuable to the mental health study of people in the human condition is to be on the other side of it twice. Like, do you remember we talked about in Joan Rivers, like how terrible it must be to be on the other side Mm. of suicide? And we probably both have people that are friends or friends of friends that have been on the other side of it. But to be on the other side of it twice, you have either a take or a numbness that nobody else has. And I think what's uniquely interesting about it in the study of mental illness and depression and suicide is that a lot of the terrible, dark thinking that goes into suicidality is either you have such a deep, sharp pain that you need to end, or also you just want others to know how much pain that you are in or implicitly in some less developed cases that they put you in. And so no matter what, the person on the other side of suicide receives all those messages because they're just going to assume 
all of it. And I think it could be uh, really uniquely valuable. It shouldn't be public, per se, to know what it's like to be on the other side of it twice. I don't know what to say. That's a heavy one, man. But that's a good Malkovich moment. That's a good Malkovich moment. Hello, Pantheon Podcast listeners. Christian Swain here to tell you more about my experience with Raycon earbuds. Our family now has three pairs of Raycon earbuds around the house. And my wife just grabbed a pair of the headphone pros to replace some headphones from a company that was double the price. And yes, she loves them. Now, if you haven't pulled the trigger on a pair of Raycons, or even if you have, but you're in the market for another pair because they're just that good, well, now is the time to check them out because they just launched their upgraded model of the best-selling everyday earbuds. With Raycon's upgraded everyday earbuds, now you also get active noise cancellation, ergonomic design, and multi-point connectivity that lets you pair with two devices at once, new quick charge function, three customizable sound styles, plus awareness mode, available in a variety of vibrant new colors to complement any and all skin tones. I even have a pair of earbuds in a cool green color. I have tried just about every earbud known to humankind, and these Raycons are fantastic. Seriously, if you've been wanting to check out Raycons, there truly is no better time. You're going to ask yourself why you didn't check them out sooner, and Raycon offers a 30-day happiness guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Go to buyraycon.com slash pantheon today to get 20% off your Raycon order, plus free shipping. That's right, you'll get 20% off and free shipping at buyraycon.com slash pantheon. Buyraycon.com slash pantheon. This episode is brought to you by Snapple. Welcome to the Snapple Market Auditory Experience. Close your eyes. Imagine you're walking into your neighborhood store. You make your way to the back and reach for your favorite Snapple flavor. You can't wait. You take a sip. Whoa, that's a lot of flavor. Mmm. What flavor are you holding? Now open your eyes and check out Snapple.com to find ridiculously flavorful Snapple near you. All right. Category four, love and marriage. This might be the entire show. I also got married a couple of times, as you know. A couple? <laughs> <laughs> How many times, actually? Only right? eight. Only eight. <laughs> and all this very well to the most wonderful man in the world. How many marriages also? How many kids? Is there anything public about these relationships? I mean, I uh, think you, you yeah. do have to auctioneer style through them. Well, I can't even pronounce all their names. And there's even a question about how many there were. And there's also a question of how old she was. Sometimes she says, I was 15 when I got married to the first guy. This author claims she was 18. But here we go. Marriage number one, Barham Belge, B-E-L-G-E. He's a Turkish diplomat in Budapest, 1937 to 41. Zsa, Zsa is somewhere around 18 or 19 to 23 years old. Though some accounts had her at 15 years old. Marriage number two, Conrad Hilton of the hotel fame. That lasted from 1942 to 1947. Zsa Zsa is 25 to 30, by my math. This marriage did result in her one child, a daughter, Francesca, and we'll return to that in a second because there's some complicated shit there. Then George Sanders, who's the actor uh, who we were discussing a moment ago from 1949 to 54. Zsa Zsa is 32 to 37. George is also the one who later married Jaja's sister, Magda. Then let's see, investor industrialist Herbert Hunter from 1962 to 66. She's 45 to 49. Oil magnate Joshua Cosden Jr. from 66 to 67. She's 49 to 50. Jack Ryan, the toy designer who helped create not just Barbie, but also Ken. There was some question about whether he came up with Barbie, but I think he definitely gets credit for Ken. That's from 1975 to 76. She's 58 to 59. Michael O'Hara, a divorce lawyer, who she met while divorcing Jack Ryan. Her divorce lawyer. Uh, 1976 to 82. She is 59 to age 65. The one husband who she says, I don't have a good relationship with. And the rest of them, she says, a good relationship. Then there's this weird one, Felipe de Alba, who is a Mexican actor, and they got married, but they weren't necessarily in international waters, and she was still kind of, they think, married to O'Hara, so they got annulled almost exactly after it happened, but she's around 66 when that goes down. 
And then the prince, Frederick Prince von Anhalt, 1986 to 2016. She is 69 when she marries him and is married to him until age 99. One note on the prince, boy, it doesn't sound like a good marriage from what I read. So even though the final husband does last 30 years and every other husband in here is five years or less. He seemed like a weirdo. Yeah, more than that. I think he's kind of a charlatan. There's also a little bit of a Casey Kasem thing. He shut out Francesca uh, and, and limited interaction as Jaja is aging. Yeah, and he was a he was a grifter and a schemer too. Yes. He claimed an heir to some throne somewhere that, that he, he was bought basically. Yeah. So he yeah. started a, and, he offered to adopt adults basically so that they could be the children of royalty. I mean, the book I, I read about the Gabors, like this guy could not be more disparaging about what a prick he was and in it for all the wrong reasons. And Josh maybe married him only for the title. However, it did last 30 years. Okay. Okay. Do we want to talk about the paternity around Francesca first? Because it's not an easy story to tell. Jaja gets pregnant as the marriage is disintegrating and by some accounts is having a fairly active sex life outside of the marriage. Jaja claimed in her 91 autobiography that she was raped by Conrad Hilton, her husband. That was the first time that claim was made. And I think we have to honor that. When Francesca was born, the divorce had been finalized. She did put Conrad Hilton's name on the birth certificate, and he never disputed it. However, he had basically no relationship and left her estranged. And Francesca never really had a dad. Nobody ever stepped up to be like a father in any kind of stepfather or, or meaningful role. What kind of mother are you, Jaja? Are you uh, pretty strict with your daughter? I, I used to think I'm a good mother, and I'm, I don't know anymore what kind of a mother I am. I don't think I'm strict enough, but after Francesca, I'm too strict. So who knows the answer nowadays? You mean you're not as strict as your mother was? Oh, of course not. But of course, in Francesca's age, I was already married. Well, that's true. So but my husband was very strict with me. <laughs> So what the fuck to make of all this? Yeah. I'll pose it in a question for you. So a lot of times we've seen in the celebrities we talk about, we've seen a lot of multiple marriages and there's been a pattern after a certain threshold that we're like, oh, that sucks because they, seems like they just kept setting themselves up for disappointment. They had to break vows. There was heartbreak. You know, anytime we saw these kind of high numbers in the three, four, five yeah. categories of marriage, often those all ended well. But that's also you and I taking marriage seriously. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, what about this? What about that there's like you just take marriage no different than you take a boyfriend? I kind of like it. It doesn't bother me that much. It really doesn't. It's kind of silly. I, I don't know. See, here's the thing. It's like... Because I do think, like, if she describes her third husband, George Sanders, as being the love of her life, and that marriage disintegrates, it does feel like somewhere after that is when this begins to become kind of a joke. The number of marriages in the Gabor family overall is absurd. It's like north of 20 between the four women, the three sisters and the mother. Yes. And maybe the first three need to be a real... Real attempt at a swing. But after that, you've been 10 run rolled out anyway. So just like, you know, throw wild pitches. Yeah. It does feel like a statement of, of that marriage is a joke. Like on one hand, it's sort of funny to me, but uh, so is Zsa Zsa Gabor. She's kind of fucking funny to me. And like, this is a series of actions that make me take her less seriously as a person, which I'm not sure how healthy that is. We had a big problem with Kenny Rogers' five marriages. The cultural context matters here. Marriage in Hollywood in the 50s and 60s and 70s during a, a period of like, you know, I don't know, peak patriarchy. I mean, maybe it's not peak patriarchy. I, I want to be a little bit careful there. I don't have a problem where she did it, when she did it, and how she did it, given who she was. All other things being equal, it's not what I want, but there is something I kind of admire about it. Because what the fuck else is she supposed to do? To be subservient to some, you know, Hollywood glam star for the rest of her life or some oil tycoon or some, you know, Turkish diplomat or whatever it may be. Like, the role she's being asked to play in society is kind of a big fucking joke, and she treats it accordingly. I kind of admire that. Yeah, she makes an absurdity of it. Exactly. Good for her. 
Uh, you know, so much so that I'm going to marry a prince who's not even a real prince. And that's going to be the final act. Yeah, I guess I can't find where it doesn't sit well with me because there is a place. And I guess that place is probably this deep, deep loneliness inside of her. And you, you I'm know, just, you I'm just it. not sure that that's not true for everybody, Amit. This comes up, I guess, on our show a few times. Like, yeah, but when there's data, just to, sort of when amplified. There's, when there's data to show it, I guess I feel a little more for it. Yeah, I don't feel sad about this. I think it's kind of funny. And bravo, Jaja. She's revealed something for us about numbers here. Let's go into triple overtime, quadruple yeah. overtime. What the hell? Why not? Still scoring? Okay, now yes. we're going to remove the extra point. It's like, I mean, this is like the rock and jock baseball game from MTV compared to the Major League Baseball of Marriage. Exactly. You know, you can just put a donkey in center field or something. That's what essentially she did with marriage. Let's move on. Okay. Category five, net worth. What did you find? 40 million. That's what I saw. I love that on Zsa Zsa Gabor. That is a great Zsa Zsa number. And this is, I think, a lot from, uh, I mean, this alleged prince who was her 30-year marriage at the end. I think that was the source of a lot of it. I actually think it's the other way. I think she was the wealthy one by that point. I think it was previous marriages. Okay. That was my read on it. But it is hard to find a reliable narrator in this story. Of where the money came from? Yeah, and how and when. Don't know if the release net worth number is part of that publicity magic as well. Did you see the Bernie Madoff thing, though? Uh, yeah. She yes. was a victim of Bernie Madoff. Yes. It's another thing. Like, she, I think she's kind of proud of it. I mean, she wasn't in, in <laughs> she wasn't in a good stage right now, but she was like, yeah. probably the the intact Jaja was like, yeah, I'm part of this like worldwide headline. I agree with that. And I think she would like that we're doing this show about her right now. I'm sure she would. She's like, they're still talking about me six years after I'm gone. Okay. Category six. Simpson Saturday Night Live or Hall of Fame. This category is a measure of how famous a person is. We include both guest appearances on SNL or The Simpsons as well as impersonations. The Simpsons in 23, like season 23 is way beyond me, but I guess Lisa goes to see Lady Gaga and Grandpa's in the crowd and says, I love you, Lady Gaga. Which I think <laughs> is funny. That's the only Zsa Zsa Gabor reference I found on The Simpsons. I love that. Never voiced herself. Yeah, now I'm going to have to call Lady Gaga that. I think Jaja's fame just peaked before The Simpsons really came because it's in the 90s things start tapering off for her. Yes. So Saturday Night Live, Victoria Jackson played her in a 1989 skit. A few of these skits, some of them really don't hold up. But she must have done the skit more than once because they actually met on Phil Donahue, Jaja and Victoria Jackson playing Jaja. I like There's Victoria Jackson. She's a great yeah, cast. Yeah, I always did too. I always thought she was funny. She does have a Hollywood star. Couldn't figure out exactly when she got it. And then I got one more thing that I'm sure you're going to love. In 1994, she was on Arsenio Hall. So Zsa, Zsa never does anything. Zsa, Zsa doesn't do anything. It's difficult to be Zsa, Zsa Gabor, but it's also wonderful to be Zsa, Zsa Gabor. So it's on the, like this. <laughs> I did watch that clip on YouTube too. in the last couple you of days. Talk about Queen of Outer Space. Yeah, I just don't think there's any question about her fame. Yes, but in my sampling of people who are under the age of 35, total blank. I wouldn't be surprised if there's like kind of a real sharp edge demographically of who has cultural memory of Zsa, Zsa or any of the Gabors. Yeah, I think that's true. I think the reaction we get from this episode will show a yeah. lot of that too. That a lot of people will be like, who the hell is that? There's not enough room for her today. All right, category seven, over under. In this category, we look at the generalized life expectancy for the year they, a person was born to see if they beat the house odds and as a measure of grace. So little fucking history lesson here. I went looking for life expectancy of a Hungarian woman born in 1917. And after 10 minutes, I discovered, oh, Hungary wasn't a country <laughs> until 1918. World War I is when Austria-Hungary split. Uh, and if you go back this far, it's very difficult to find reliable data, uh, year specific. So what I found for Austrian woman in 1915 was 46.24 years and 1920 was 45.75 years. So there's actually a drop off because of the war. So somewhere around almost exactly 46 years, if you take the average for 1917, she lived to 99. This might be our deepest home run, I think. I think that's probably right. You know, I said anti-ageist and the five things, but I think that also it's like the age defiance 
too. I think we can also say very, very graceful. Definitely. Like, you know, you look at these shows that she was on, Arsenio Hall, 1994. Yeah. Okay? So she yeah. died in 2016. So she's, what, 78 or so? Because she still That's- had that exact same quick wit. You know, she was still yeah. attractive. She was still flirtatious. She was still dominating every conversation, demanding every batted eye. Fun to put on your TV. Yeah. She was great. So one day last week, I picked up one of my all-time favorite people, and the two of us spent the afternoon eating fast food here in Southern California. You got Zsa, Zsa Gabor with me. Zsa, Zsa would like a filet fish <laughs> sandwich. What kind of wine do you have? <laughs> Look at uh, Zsa, Zsa what do you think of that? Look at her pounding down those fries. <laughs> Zsa, Zsa loves her fries. One other thing I did want to note on this World War thing, so this is World War II. This wasn't my Malkovich moment, but it almost was. The way she escapes Austria-Hungary, but then Turkey, I mean, she has diplomatic immunity because of her first husband, but she ends up traveling to the Middle East. She gets stuck in Baghdad for a month. Then she goes through India and eventually East Asia before she reunites with her sister, who had already made the move to the U.S. Her journey out of Europe with apparently 21 uh, suitcases. That was her like months-long journey uh, of escaping Europe. And she had an affair with Ataturk. That's right. I mean, her life is fucking eventful. It's incredible. She's globetrotting and she is hanging out with everybody. So I'd call that graceful. Clear winner on the over. And I think clear winner on grace. I agree. Let's pause for a word from our sponsor. So, Michael, we each do our own set of research as we prepare for these shows. Mm -hmm. I notice you always reference a biography and you have like a paperback biography with you as we come to studio. Yeah. So I am to assume that you're getting these from some online mega mart. Is that correct? No, not at all. The first thing I do when you and I decide on our next dead celebrity is I go and find out, is there a biography on this person? And is that biography available at half price books? There's a store right up the street from me, an actual brick and mortar store where I can walk in. When I go there to find out, do they have a biography for our next dead celebrity? But I always wind up picking up more books. I go through the children's section. I'm a sucker for a good page turner, so I go through the murder mystery section. They also have rare collections. They have signed stuff. I don't know how this sounds to you, but I actually, I love the smell of half price books. It's got that old book smell. I do, I like that too. Isn't that a great smell? Yeah, and you know what? Half Price Books is currently celebrating 50 years of buying and selling books, movies, and music. There are more than 120 stores, and you can find out more about Half Price Books at hpb.com. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust, or is it a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Hey, Famous and Gravy listeners. I want to tell you about a show I think you'll enjoy, Play On Podcasts. Epic audio adventures that reimagine Shakespeare's timeless tales, featuring original music composition and the voices of award-winning actors. Each episode explores plays from Macbeth to A Midsummer Night's Dream in a way that you can actually understand it, and created specifically for the podcast form by some of America's most exciting playwrights, directors and composers, and performed by stage and screen's best. Check out their current season of King Lear that stars Emmy winner Keith David and Severance star Tramel Tillman. Hear Shakespeare like you've never heard before. Subscribe to Play On Podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. Thus far, we have really been exploring what's knowable about a person, what data are available. At this point, we're going to get to the more introspective questions where we try and take a better guess of what we think it would have been like to have been this person. First of these categories is man in the mirror. What did they think about their own reflection? Amit, what's your man in the mirror for Zsa Zsa Gabor? I think A++. I don't have a hot take on this. I went the exact same. 
I said, she was beautiful and she liked getting done up and she liked presenting herself and she was very confident about it. And let's move on. I think that was the fastest man in the mirror we've ever had. I know. Uh, let's go on to the next category, outgoing message. How do we think she felt about the sound of her own voice when she heard it on an answering machine? And would she have actually recorded it or used the default setting on her outgoing voicemail? What do you got? I think she loved her own voice, and she loved hearing it. She loved when other people heard it. She loved it being broadcast. And I think not only would she put it on her outgoing voicemail, but she would, like— Maintain two numbers, probably an external one that she'd publicize to the world that everyone can call and hear Zsa Zsa's voicemail, and then have another one that's her private one, which has a similar voicemail. I had 100% the exact same opinion. Next category, regrets, public or private? What we really want to know is what, if anything, kept this person awake at night. I struggled here. Did you have big things? Uh, I had one big thing. Okay. I'll go with my two smaller things. These are both in the, I mean, I'm sure there's stuff out there. The woman is interviewed all the fucking time. There's 50 years of footage to comb through. And I'm sure the question of Jaja, don't you regret? And she might've said something, but I do think she changes her story a lot. So I guess all of that for me gave a little bit of a pass on the public regrets. On the private regrets, I one of them I already mentioned her acting career, I think it could have gone differently. I think she did actually have talent and she could have like done better movies than Queen of Outer Space and Naked Gun Two and a Half. Yes. And then I also have some questions about her final husband. She says in her autobiography, nobody knows what we have and she does stay with him for forever. But I, I just wonder, it doesn't look like a happy marriage to me. So I, I wrote that one down as well. Yeah, what did you got? So if she was raped by Conrad Hilton, her husband, reproductive rights was an entirely different world back then, which I realize yeah. we're, we're kind of standing again at a watershed. But you've got to wonder about having a child um, as a result of rape. I guess it wasn't really a choice back then. So maybe it's not a no, conscious— No, it's a really maybe, good question, and it's worth thinking about. I mean, it's a, it's a contentious relationship. The author of the book I read, it sounded like among Sam Staggs, among other things, he was closest to Francesca than the other Gabors. And it sounded like she also suffered from a lot of mental health issues, including, you know, addiction. Yeah, she had yeah. nothing resembling a father figure. Right. She had, in fact, a mother that made a mockery of her lack of familyness. Although her mother only and always spoke very highly of her anytime you saw her in an interview you know, kept yeah. her away from the cameras. But it's difficult. It's difficult to be a child of that type of character. No matter what, no matter how much they protect you, you still see it on screen and you still hear the criticisms. And you I mean, see that. I, he, look, Ahmed, I really do think that there's a question in my mind of how did Zsa Zsa Gabor understand and experience love? I, I, I do think that this thing about seeking attention is really about seeking love in some sense. I do wonder if this lifelong drive to continue to seek attention isn't about seeking affection and love, and that the marriages speak to that. And if you struggle with that, then in all likelihood, your children are going to struggle with that as well, which I think is all but self-evident here when it comes to Francesca's life. It sounds thoroughly tragic and I think this idea that materialism can substitute for love is one of the biggest fucking problems in our society and in our world and in our culture. Yes. And, and that there's something about Zsa, Zsa Gabor's existence and her love of diamonds and her love of, you know, materialistic things that epitomizes that. I do think that gift giving is one of the five languages of love and it matters. But the, the other forms of deep human connection feel like they're absent here. And I think that that transferred to her daughter's life. Yeah. I just, I hope that maybe she got some of the love feeling from her daughter. And it seems like that in the way she talked about her in a lot of the early interviews and all, just being so protective of her. And like I said, my thing I loved, number one, was compliments. And when she said yeah. certain compliments, I believed them. And the way she spoke about her daughter, I also believed that. Words of affirmation are another love language, so I agree. Next category, good dreams or bad dreams? This is not about personal perception, but rather does this person look haunted? 
something in the eye that suggests inner turmoil, inner demons, unresolved trauma. She hides it well. I mean, there's something in the behavior that certainly suggests that, but in the eyes, I mean, Is that a bad dreams answer? (laughs) I I agree. It's a speculation of bad dreams because of all the behavior and exactly what you just said about love. You know, there's definitely a deficiency there, but however, the gauge of the look in the eye, I don't think applies on this one. Fair enough. The standard I'm using for the look in the eye is fake laugh. She has a fake laugh. And the fact that she can't, do that or that she feels like she has to kind of fake laugh it off on the talk shows, that's my indication. Yeah, that's a good tell. I like that. And I didn't notice it until you brought it up, but I 100% agree. Her laugh feels very forced and inauthentic. Well, it's nice of you to come back and, and congratulations. <laughs> when, when were you married? Was it about a year ago? I went bad dreams as well, based on, I don't know, it, it, maybe it isn't as much the look of the eye, because I agree, she does hide it. It's beauty as a skill also, I guess. You know, we've yeah. we've presupposed that you can always sort of tell. But yeah. I don't know. Unless you know the whole story with her, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, we both went to bad. We both, we both went to bad dreams. Right. But what we're talking about is that if you just saw a mute video of the person, would you yeah. see the look in the eye? Nah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You need more data. All right. Second to last category, cocktail, coffee, or cannabis. This is where we ask, which one would we most want to do with our dead guest? This may be a question of what drug sounds like the most fun to partake with this person, or another philosophy is that a particular kind of drug might allow access to a part that we're most curious about. What do you got? Like six shots of Jameson right off the bat. <laughs> because because of this character that she plays. And I want to, I don't know of any other way to disarm it or get at the actual inner being. She has to get lampshade drunk in order to just kind of spill all about like where what she really wants and where she really aches and all the all the emotions that have to come out. I love that answer. I want cannabis. I want to get high with Jaja Gabor. For one reason, I think she's funny. And I think she would fucking crack me that up. Is very and even true. if her laugh is a little bit inauthentic, <laughs> I, I kind of feel like we'd crack each other up and just have like a delightful time. I think I'd like to attend one of her parties, you know? And I'd like to be a little high and a little bit like, I don't know, even a little bit like in a dreamy state, you know? Yeah, um, I could see you like kicking off your stilettos and just letting go with Jaja at one of the mansion parties. Fucking A. Fucking A. All right, I think we're here. Our final category, the Vanderbeek, named after James Vanderbeek, who famously said in Varsity Blues, I don't want your life. So based on everything we've talked about, Amit, the big question is, do you want this life? Do you think it's easy? Do you think it's an easy answer? It's not as easy as I would have thought. Yeah, I don't... There's a lot that's undesirable. I don't see a tremendous amount of relational wealth, but I do see a lot of fun. And I do kind of like the, you know, you just sort of skip and tap dance your way through what may be a big fucking joke. And if you're going to do it, make the most of it. Go on TV a lot, travel the world, have exciting lovers, have a story to tell, captivate attention, and look good. I think I still come to the same place where overall it looks a little bit shallow. And your point earlier of meaning But I don't know. I'm closer to a 50-50 on this than I would have thought. She was certainly loved by a lot of fans and a lot of women during those peak years. She was a symbol of control. I'm not sure what's so bad. There's something about her life that is, to me, a sort of different set of considerations than what we usually come to here. Because I do think that we tend to, you know, look at artistic catharsis, and we do tend to look at impact and legacy on history, and we do tend to look at relational wealth. And I'm not saying much of any of those things, yet there's still something kind of sort of appealing about her existence that it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe, why not? There, There is something about what are we asking here? And this question of meaning, not necessarily significance in history, but at least you know, intimacy beyond friends and, and, and two family members. I don't, I, I think that there's like a love that's taken for granted in places. Yes, I'll love you. I'll marry you. Yes, of course, I love my sister, who I actually argue with all the fucking time. And of course, I love my father, who I haven't seen since I was 15 years old. I, I, I think that there's a lot in her story. That's just not the life I want, man. But it's more attractive than I would have thought. But I'll give my answer. And my answer is no. I don't want your life. Okay. 
those are the key points is the relational wealth and the deep intimate love. I think she didn't get that and was deprived of that. But I also think she did a lot better than a lot of people. Yeah. And even a lot of people that may have had relational wealth or intimate love. You know, it's not unanimously desirable for me, but I think it's better than a lot of other options. And, you know, I point, I think it just goes back to the the things that I said I loved about her. And that was the anti-aging, you know, just living it up until the end. And she was a symbol for some empowerment and some good. And there's a little bit of meaning in that, right? She may not be remembered by anybody after our generation, but certainly if she played some sort of influence and inspiring confidence of people of our generation, that does play out in many ways into the future. So I will go, I will go a warm yes. I want your life, Zsa Zsa Gabor. Wow. I mean, to your point about impact, for what it's worth, she was a very early animal rights activist. Yeah. And had like... Horses, dogs, cats. I mean, her relationship with her animals is exactly what you'd expect. <laughs> and it's kind of wonderful. So you're a yes. You're a yes. What we're talking about in the Vanderbeek is not choosing your ideal life. It's not trading your own life. It's just saying, you know, are you going to return this one to the store? And I don't think so. Shit. I think America is going to be satisfied with what we've done here tonight. Good. <laughs> All right. Amit, you have died, darling. <laughs> You're Zsa Zsa Gabor. You're meeting St. Peter at the Pearly Gates. The floor is yours. St. Peter, I adore you. You are a handsome, gorgeous, <laughs> beautiful man. We're not going to summarize actions. We're not going to summarize intent. We're just going to summarize the game. I played it with a smile on my face. I had a lot of fun playing the game. I brought people into the game. I insisted they all play the game. I insisted they batted the beach ball around. And I played the game till the end. I loved the game. The game was fun. And I won the game. So I'm going in. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Famous and Gravy. If you're enjoying our show, we have a favor to ask. We hear from a lot of people that this show cheers them up. It puts them in a good mood. So think of somebody in your life, just one person who you'd like to cheer up and share an episode of our show with them. Be like, hey man, here's an episode of Famous and Gravy. Share it with anybody who you think could stand to be put in a good mood. We are on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at Famous and Gravy. We also have a newsletter, which you can sign up for on our website, famousandgravy.com. Famous and Gravy was created by Amit Kapoor and me, Michael Osborne. This episode was produced by Jacob Weiss. Original theme music by Kevin Strang. And thanks so much to our sponsor, Half Price Books. Thank you again for listening. Please share this episode, and we hope to see you next time. It's NFL draft season, and that means it's time to start thinking about fantasy football. FantasyPoints.com features industry-leading experts and prognosticators using proprietary hand-charted data to help you score more fantasy points. FantasyPoints.com is the place to go for whatever kind of fantasy football you play. Whether you play fantasy football, daily fantasy sports, or do a little bit of everything, Fantasy Points has the meticulously researched content to guide you to victory. And why wait for the fall? Fantasy Points also covers the new spring football league, the UFL. Join the guru, John Hansen, Scott Barrett, Joe Dolan, and other massive names in the fantasy football universe with an exclusive offer. Use code Pantheon for 15% off any Fantasy Points package, including the all-in package, with access to every article, tool, and data nugget that Fantasy Points has to offer. That's FantasyPoints.com and code Pantheon for 15% off at Fantasy Points. FantasyPoints.com, code Pantheon. Score more Fantasy Points. Fantasy Points.